I'm going to give you a general overview of the structure of biogeometry as a body of vibrational science. How is it that we are conscious spiritual beings living in a physical world, in a physical body, and don't remember who we are or how we got here? Dr. Kareem himself actually uses to be able to test any uh, person for which of the biosignatures they need and how to get it into their energetic system. So for every organ of the body, again, the biosignatures are the energy movement circulations within that system. And this connects to all types of energetic functions now we primarily focus on it for healing work, but what it's actually doing is it's restoring a natural balance and resonance. The reason that we have this feeling of disease is because we're no longer in resonance with the higher source that is supposed to be supporting the functions of the body. That's way beyond the consciousness of most people, but every classical tradition was aware of it and they had to restore that connection. So in the ancient Egyptian mysteries, they understood about the importance, let's say, of the heart. And so there are particular biosignatures for the heart that not only have a effect at a more gross physical vitality level, it also has effects on human consciousness. So for example, the place of the sinoatrial node or the sinus node, the master pacemaker of the body, is actually the place understood by the ancient Egyptians and by Sufi traditions today as the place that higher vibrational forces resonate in the human physical body and restore our connection to higher sources. So there's deeper esoteric aspects of the biosignatures that we get into in the trainings. And in the advanced training, we talk about ways that we can modify the biosignatures with different numbers of movements. This is called bionumerals. Years ago, I had a very serious car accident, serious damage to my neck and my spine, had a hard time just being able to move around. And through the use of the correct bionumeral alteration, of a biosignature, it gave me back my quality of life and got me back out in the world again. Is one of the reasons I decided to spend as much time as I have with Dr. Kareem and working with the biogeometry work. And when you change the numerical sequencing of the patterns, it actually then actually changes the level that the pattern is vibrating with. So all these different things connect together into a master energy science. I'm just doing my best tonight to very quickly lay out an overview of some of the parts for you. Now, if we get into more detail, we can actually find that every one of the biosignatures resonates with specific subplanes of the different planes. So that's some of the work in the advanced training. And we can actually test that directly once people learn the advanced training how to test the energy. Now, for practical work, one of the major things that we teach people is harmonizing electromagnetic fields. Dr. Kareem actually demonstrated that he could harmonize the electromagnetic fields in entire small cities in a project in Switzerland in 2003. How do you change the vibrational quality being transmitted on electromagnetic waves to ways that they are less biologically harmful? Again, he's done a tremendous amount of work with this. His work has been observed by the Swiss government and many other research institutes. And we have various types of tools that we can use to create energetic effects. This biogeometry cube, this shows an earlier version of the cube. I'll show you later the one that just came out like literally a few weeks ago. But the cube creates a strong concentration of this BG3 harmonizing force in an environment. Dr. Kareem worked with Masuro Emoto and at his research lab in Liechtenstein, where he had his European operations to take water crystal pictures, they were able to show the way that just having the cube in the same room as standard tap water transformed the quality to the pictures you see right here. Emoto also said that because the pictures you see in his book are cherry-picked out of a sequence of different crystallizations, because it crystallizes differently every time, he said that the forms created in the water crystals by the biogeometry energies were the most consistent in optimal crystallizations of any energetic source that he investigated. So this shows some of the biogeometry stands with dials. These are what we use in the advanced training. The Hamburg emitter is used in the Swiss project in Hamburg, Switzerland. That's where it got its name. This allows us actually to set this up and to target distant sources of electromagnetic disturbance, cell towers, things of that kind, and to actually transmute it from the distant source. Within a location itself, things like the space harmonizer will help to create a balanced energy within the location. The outdoor stand is used in the earth itself to balance and harmonize the energies in the earth. And so that then connects to our needing to balance also the subtle radiation grids inside the earth. Now, in North America, we primarily know about the Earth energy grids from the German discoveries of the last hundred years, and it's primarily known by dowsers. And in North America, that's primarily mental dowsers. But a lot of the work they do has to do with detecting and balancing the Earth energy grids. 
Now, this was one of the fundamental sciences of the ancient world. They understood that the entire Earth is based on a vibrational grid network that then manifests on any particular point of land in a set of energetic lines that superimpose in particular ways. And these energy lines may either have a detrimental energy quality, what we call geopathic grids, or they may have highly beneficial qualities. Because when they're on a sacred power spot, they're running the BG3 energies. So we go into a lot of detail in the biogeometry training about how they actually understood and worked with this in the ancient world. So for example, here is a particular church in Germany, and when you do an energetic analysis of where it's situated, it has to be on a power spot. Today, we'll put a church in any old place, we'll put it in a strip mall. We don't think anything about the energetics of it. But in the ancient world, you would never build a temple for any tradition anywhere but on a sacred power spot. Otherwise, it simply wouldn't have the right energetics that you're trying to connect a person to. It wasn't just an abstract intellectual thing. You had to connect a person's energetic field, their grid pattern, back to the larger energetic grid through a sacred power spot. And so, just give you a few examples of what they would do. Where is the largest beneficial energy line running within the sacred power spot? That's going to be the central axis of the building. Then where are the different energy lines coming in and where the majority of beneficial energy lines are crossing together. Whenever energy lines cross together, they create a vortex. And if it's a beneficial energy, then it's a beneficial BG3 vortex. And so that's going to be where they place the altar. So they're actually using the Earth's own energy lines to pattern out everything for the temple because the temple has to operate like an organ in a living body. The building has to rise up out of the Earth's energy field like a living thing. So that's what we have here. In a seed is the complete pattern matrix for everything that seed will ever do once it begins to grow and sprout and blossom and fruit and wither and decay and disappear. All those stages are hidden within the seed. And so all things go through this process. So when we observe the growth of a child, we see all of these stages one after another in a lawful process. The life of every human being from an infant to old age is a microcosmic fractal of what we go through over great periods of time in spiritual development. It follows a particular trajectory. So to clarify some of this, and this is a very general gloss on it, we descend originally from spirit to earth. And with human development, we went through a particular process that in the Indian tradition is referred to as Kali Yuga. This Kali Yuga spiritual tradition was understood as being the spiritual dark age. And depending on which of the Indian teachers you talk to, some say that we're still in Kali Yuga and will be for a long time to come. Others, such as in the Sri Yuktisvara Babaji lineage, say that it's actually already ended. And actually, the timing of the Kali Yuga dark age for human evolution is exactly the same for the ending point between the European Rosicrucians and the Babaji Sri Yuktisvara lineage, which is a very interesting link. So in this Kali Yuga Dark Age, we had a particular situation take place. In the early times, human beings were not self-aware. You study ancient texts, they're always identifying themselves with uh, the tribe, the group. I am so-and-so, the Philistine, the Samurite, whatever it might be. They always identify with the group. In ancient Greece, to be exiled from your city was like a fate worse than death. Today, it's like, you're not going to put me in jail, I just get to leave the city? Great, I'm gone. But for them, to be separated from the group was terrible. It was a punishment because they had a group consciousness. So they weren't self-aware, but what they did have in early times was a lot of clairvoyance. And so you still see this with some of the traditional peoples on the earth today. Those traditional peoples preserve this type of native clairvoyance that can be quite strong. And the Rosicrucian Sea is actually being related to the blood in a particular way. So what happens over time is that as we become more self-aware, we're not fully self-aware, but we're moving toward it. We're becoming more individual in our self-awareness. This leads to what the great teachers in ancient India referred to as the Kali Yuga Dark Age, because literally the clairvoyance is going dark. The people in India are losing their clairvoyant faculties. And we can no longer directly see spirit. And so there's a kind of a panic that you can see in some of these old texts that leads to the teaching of, well, the physical world's an illusion. You're about to get stranded here. This is actually a place of suffering. So get off the cycle of karma and reincarnation, off the suffering, and just go back to the spiritual world to nirvana permanently. 